Hello and welcome to part B of our depression series when we do all things biological. biological. Let's go. The first biological explanation of depression is the biochemical explanation and the permissive amine theory. It argues that depression is caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters in the brain. Noradrenaline, serotonin and dopamine are all neurotransmitters of the monoamine group. They act at synapses between neurons in the brain and they may either facilitate or block nervous transmission. Under normal conditions, all three are related to mood. Mood is controlled by noradrenaline level. If it's high, then you're happy. If it's low, then you're sad. The level, the level of serotonin controls the level of noradrenaline. When serotonin is low, noradrenaline levels are less controlled and so may fluctuate wildly. Dopamine is also involved, but no one actually knows how yet. It is suggested that in depression, serotonin levels are low and as a consequence of inherited individual differences and that abnormal serotonin levels present, prevent decent control of the other two. So the levels of dopamine and noradrenaline are permitted to fluctuate more widely, leading to mood swings. Two categories for the AO2 for biochemical are correlational studies and drug studies. Supporting evidence comes from studies showing a link between neurotransmitters and mood. One study compared substances found in urine from depressed patients and normals. Compounds produced by a byproduct of the action of enzymes of noradrenaline and serotonin were present in smaller amounts in the urine of depressed patients. This, this finding suggests that depressed patients have lower levels of noradrenaline and serotonin. But a confounding factor is that byproducts in urine are also affected by motor activity. Depressed patients are less active, and this could be a reason for the lower levels. Another problem is bidirectional ambiguity, as it is hard to know whether low levels of noradrenaline and serotonin cause the depression or whether the depression altered the levels of these neurotransmitters. Further support comes from studies of diet focusing on tryptophan, a substance in food that is a precursor needed to make serotonin. If patients are fed a diet low on this, then depressive symptoms worsen. Even in normal people, this diet leads to an increased in depressed mood. This again suggests a link between serotonin level and mood. On to drug studies and beginning with recipine, a drug administered for high blood pressure known to reduce noradrenaline. When given to participants, it had the side effects of depressive symptoms and suicidal thoughts. This suggests a link between noradrenaline levels and suicidal thoughts. Antidepressant drugs like uh, MAOIs, which block the enzyme monoamine oxidase that deactivates monoamines, thus increasing levels of serotonin and noradrenaline. These drugs are effective in treating depression and thus suggest serotonin and noradrenaline are involved. But there are several criticisms of the antidepressant evidence. Delayed effects. Drugs affect NT levels m almost immediately, yet take 7 to 14 days to lift depression symptoms. The treatment etiology fallacy, drug studies uh, do not provide direct evidence. We must be careful not to assume that the success of the treatment indicates the course. Drug treatments don't help everyone. They're often only 65% effective, yet affect neurotransmitters in everyone, suggesting a link between depression and neurotransmitters is not simple. And some argue that drug companies promote biochemical theories to increase sales of drugs. Oh, outrageous. On to genetic explanations, which argues that depression is inherited from the DNA from our parents. Right theory is a way in which depression genes may have evolved as they were advantageous in the EEA. It proposes that depression is an adaptive response to losing rank in status conflict, seeing oneself as the loser. Depression would be adaptive in such situations as it helps the individual adjust to the fact that they have just lost. It prevents the loser from risking further injury by continuing with the conflict. Depression makes the loser hide away and lick wounds due to decreased energy energy and lack of sociability, etc. Et it may be that in today's modern society, other forms of loss trigger depression. Supporting evidence comes from family studies. The theory is that if there is a genetic cause to depression, then the incidence of depression will be higher in the relatives of depressed patients than in the general population. One study found that the first relatives of depressives were two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with depression than the first relatives of non-depressives. But in family studies, it's difficult to separate out the effects of nature and nurture, as relatives share the same environment as well as genes, so twin studies are used. A key principle of twin studies is the comparison of, FZ, of MZ and DZ twins living together. MZ twins sharing 100% of their DNA and DZ only 50% on average. Both sets of twins are shared, uh, share the same shared environment. Therefore, if uh, MZs are more concordant, then it suggests the role of genes. One study tested 200 twin pairs, finding concordance rates of 46% for MZ and 20% for DZ. 
But MZ concordance is never 100%, so the cause cannot solely be genetic. Therefore, the explanation is reductionist, ignoring other factors like the environment. The Dyethys stress model is much more likely um, where there is a genetic vulnerability, but in order to develop a mental illness, an environmental trigger is needed. One study found that when other disorders like anxiety disorders were included, the concordance rate among close relatives rose. Environmental triggers may determine the specific order that develops. This comorbidity may explain the low concordance rates for MZ twins. There are issues with the theory behind twin studies as MZ and DZ twins may not share the same degree of shared environment. MZ twins look identical, obviously, so may be treated more similarly. So the reason they are more concordant may be due to the more similar environments. And also, twins aren't typical of the population. Their development is different. For example, they're likely to be born smaller, so you can't really generalise. Sample sizes are relatively small also, and percentages aren't always similar to between studies. Another study type is adoption studies. If depression is genetic, then an adopted child which will be much more similar to their biological parents than its adoptive parents. One study found that biological relatives of adopted depressives were eight times more likely than adoptive relatives to develop depression. Adoption studies are the best way to separate genes from environment. But we don't know how early the adoption took place or any effects on development. And finally, genetic explanations are very deterministic, removing blame from patients but possibly causing worry of relatives having the disorder. On to treatments, and the most common treatment is antidepressant drugs. The biochemical explanation argues that low levels of, neuro of the neurotransmitter serotonin causes depression, so drugs act to increase serotonin levels. The first type is MAOIs, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors like Nardil. They block the enzyme monoamine oxidase. You might say that they inhibit it. This therefore prevents the breakdown of noradrenaline and serotonin, so the levels of these neurotransmitters increase. The second type is SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac or Seroxac. They are much more recent and have been widely prescribed since the 1990s. They block an enzyme that removes serotonin from the synapses between neurons, hence serotonin levels are increased. AO2 for this is split into that for MAOIs, SSRIs and general drug studies. Beginning with MAOIs, they have been found effective in treating depression in 65-75% to of cases, compared to 33% of placebos. But this doesn't mean depression was cured, just that symptoms improved. There are also general problems with placebo trials, as they are designed to take into account expectancy effects, but the patients may work out that they are on the placebo as they won't have any side effects. Therefore, the findings may not be valid. MAOIs were found to have a toxic effect, causing cerebral hemorrhages if combined with other drugs and certain foods and drinks containing tyramine. These foods include some cheeses, caffeine, bananas, beers, nuts and yeast extract. It increases over time, so foods such as fruit and meat may be safe when fresh, but dangerous when not. Tyramine causes blood vessels to narrow, leading to increased blood pressure, which can lead to bleeding in the tiny capillaries of the brain. This means patients have to eat a special diet to avoid tyramine. Other side effects of MAOIs include convulsions, weight gain, hallucinations and mania. On to SSRIs and Prozac, which... Um, was hailed as the wonder drug for depression when it was introduced in the late 80s. It was the most prescribed antidepressant due to the claim that people didn't become dependent and the few side effects. But since their launch, SSRIs have become targeted of a media frenzy, as there have been many reports that they increase preoccupation with violence and suicide. For example, some have suggested a link with the American school shootings and SSRIs. Also, up to 70% experience sexual dysfunction, including impotence. Also, they don't have an immediate effect on mood. In fact, they take up to four weeks before a noticeable effect. On to general issues with drug studies and showing the effectiveness and safety of chemotherapy. Firstly, some argue that the positive findings are a result of publication bias, where negative or neutral results are often not published. And even worse, it's accusations that the drug companies themselves fund research. It has been shown that research funded by these companies is more likely to find favourable results than the research by other sources, and it may be that drug companies actively suppress damaging findings. This has been highlighted recently with the case of Seroxat. Legal challenges have found that studies were altered to increase the effectiveness of it in children and that they suppressed a finding that Seroxat had led to a six-fold increase in suicidal behaviour. We'd be interested to hear your views on this, so let us know what your opinions and thoughts are down in the comments. 
On to ECT, our second and last treatment, which involves the passage of electrical current through the brain of around 70 to 130 volts. Electrodes are attached to the head and the current is passed through the brain for a second or less. This induces a seizure lasting no longer than two minutes. Patients regain consciousness about 15 minutes later and have no memory of the events immediately prior to treatment. This is done two or three times a week for one to four weeks and may be repeated if the patient relapses. The convulsion acts upon neurotransmission neuro chemical transmission in a way that improves a person's mood state. Many psychological changes occur and it's difficult to establish which is most important. Since ECT is the most successful in treating depression, it's most likely that noradrenaline and serotonin are involved. The original procedure was bilateral, so the current was passed through both cerebral hemispheres at a time and a patient was awake prior to the procedure. The new procedure uses a strong muscle relaxant and anaesthetic and is now unilateral, passing current through the non-dominant hemisphere only. AO2 for this starts starts with a simple but shocking revelation that though it is still done, we still don't know how it works. But it does work, as studies indicate that 60-70% of patients improve with ECT, although a large proportion of these become depressed again in the following year. ECT should only be administered if antidepressant drugs have failed, though a high relapse rate has been found. It has been found to be successful in treating severe depression in patients where all other methods have failed. Many argue that this is sufficient justification for its use, especially as it prevents suicide. When it was first introduced, there were dangerous side effects such as bone fractures. But in the new procedure, side effects are reduced, though memory loss still occurs. Memory loss does remain a significant problem, and in a review of studies, it was found that at least a third of patients complained of persistent memory loss. A recent review of ECT by the Department of Health in 2007 reported 30% of ECT patients patients within the last two years reported that it led to permanent fear and anxiety. So the treatment may just be replacing the focus of the condition from depression to fear and anxiety. ECT does remain controversial as it requires consent from the patient or a close relative and as we said only uses it as a last resort. But a Department of Health report in 1999 found that of 700 patients who received ECT after being sectioned, 59% had not consented to the treatment. Even if patients do consent, there is an issue of being f fully informed of the side effects. ECT also has a history of abuse being used as a means of punishing or controlling people in mental hospitals. And that's it for part B. Join us next time for part C, which is all psychological. We're very excited. Very excited. We'll see you then. Goodbye. Thanks for listening.